Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. I'm Kyle Cleveland with Temple University, Japan. This is ICAST, a multimedia channel that we have through our Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. And today we have a panel entitled Civil Society in the 311 Virtuous Cycle with Sarah Jean Rosito, Angela Ortiz, and Kayla Ward. All of these folks are experts and NGO either leaders and or activists who've spent a considerable amount of time up in Tohoku and are going to be able to relate to us their experiences and I think give a kind of insider's view on the trajectory of recovery up in Tohoku since the 2011 disasters. Each of them will speak for about 12, 14 minutes, something like that, and then we'll go to a Q&A. First up, we have Caleb Ward. She is a dual doctorate candidate in sociology and environmental science and policy at Michigan State University. Kayla has worked with MPOs in Japan since 2014 and continues to support affected communities in Japan by studying their social networks and relationships, by providing consultation on common rural problems and providing other information or resources. Her interests focus mainly on community development and sustainability in post-disaster communities especially in Miyagi, Japan, after the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. She focuses on the intersection of disaster and environmental, social, political, and economic problems. For several years, she has experience with NGOs in Japan and in the US. She currently collaborates with NGOs in the following areas, community sustainability and redevelopment, economic empowerment, and community organizing. As I mentioned, she's a dual doctoral candidate in sociology and environmental science and policy at Michigan State. Last year, she was a Fulbright Japan Graduate Research Fellow. Hello, everyone. It is great to be here today with you all. Um, as Kyle just mentioned, my name is Kaylee Ward, and I'm going to be going through um, what's called the three Ds, or depopulation, deindustrialization, and disaster, and give a general review of how each of these affect communities and how those of us working with sort of organizations, MPOs, and NGOs have been responding to them. I'm going to be framing these issues on how I've encountered them in my work, and I'll be sharing some of my insights from my work with rural communities, organizations, and stakeholders in promoting healthy uh, communities. Um, to mm -hmm. start, depopulation has been an issue in Japan well before 311. It was the most notable in, uh, with urbanization after World War II as Japan rebuilt itself. Most significantly, there was a hyper-focus on the Kanto region and other major port cities such as Osaka and Kobe, which left other more regions like Tohoku really without much support or development. Um, Historically, this process has pulled workers, families, and young people from Tohoku to urban centers, especially to Tokyo. Um, as for one example, when we look at agricultural workers, um, the effects of depopulation has created a problem where more than 42% of that population is now over 66 years old. Um, and that was in 2017. So now we're looking at a population that's over 70 years old. Um, so not only does depopulation signal issues with industry, it also signifies community collapse in some cases. And historically, the national government has pursued interventions if it was economically viable or economically feasible for them to do so. In the wake of 311, this approach has changed somewhat. So in 2014, there was a push for regional development, although this kind of approach is better than previous policies. Um, there is still a lack of consideration for um, prefectures' unique problems, needs, and resources. And this also applies to the communities with, within those prefectures. Most significantly, uh, regional development has still overwhelmingly remained economically based, especially with consideration for subsidies and technological advancements being the main focus. So a lot of my work that I've done has been in the community of Minami Sanriku and Miyagi, but also in Kesanuma and Ishinomaki, where I've worked with farmers and fishers and mothers and resident stakeholders in a whole variety of ways. And while they are very appreciative of these sort of interventions, um, there's really lack of consideration for how these interventions are very inequitable. Um, people, some people are helped 100% of the time, and some people are left isolated and without much assistance. So generally, when I'm working with these um, people in the community, there is a recognition of being you know, um, happy to have these sort of subsidies, but generally they're inequitable and they're not distributed very well amongst people. Um, additionally, some people don't often qualify for assistance, so then you have people who are sort of left out. Um, and then, especially with the farmers that I've worked with, although they have qualified for loans and assistance, that means they take on an enormative amount of debt. Um, so right now, post-disaster, 10 years, 20 later on, they're still going to be re responsible for those financial obligations. The other thing that's really important when we're talking about depopulation is the fact that there really is distrust between local communities, 
government, government agencies, so on and so forth. And that's primarily because of the government's um, poor handling of this disaster, especially with information and things of that sort when we think of places like Fukushima, for example. Um, another significant issue post-disaster has been um, the extreme increase in out-migration um, from disaster-affected communities in Tohoku. The government has made efforts to offer sort of resettlement programs through um, volunteer opportunities in specific regions in Japan. Um, although those resettlement programs tend to be very small scale and don't have much impact on addressing depopulation currently. So really there is a need to get back to community and get back to uh, investing in the communities that are directly affected, whether that's through resettlement programs or through other ways in which to mitigate depopulation's effects. So in the case of Minami Sanriku, the reason why depopulation is so important to address is because immediately after the disaster, 9,700 people were displaced, and then 6,000 of those people roughly were put into temporary housing. And then as of December 2019, that housing finally closed. So for a long period of time, people have been displaced and estranged from their communities. So it's very important to get them back and reintegrated. The other thing to consider is that going forward into the future, we as people invested in the revitalization of Tohoku need to address depopulation as quickly as possible and mobilize resources. And really, the organizations that I participate in, which is Place to Grow, uh, that Angela is the representative director of, really does a good job of this, mobilizing community-based resources. Um, and the reason why I say we need to focus on depopulation immediately is that by about 2030, we're going to have the problem of older residents who maintain a lot of small businesses and communities retiring, and those businesses are going to close, and that's going to cause more problems with loss of jobs, so on and so forth. Um, I'd like to leave off here by saying that the communities that I work with are prepared um, for many of the necessary transitions that need to happen, such as bringing in new young people, families, and workers to help sustain their communities. Um, going forward, we need to support resettlement into these communities and help those who've had no choice but to leave return to these communities. So moving on for deindustrialization, before 311, there of course was not much invested into Tohoku, um, and so when we often think of economic problems, um, often we think of economic problems in Japan or economic recessions in Japan, we're thinking about the bubble economy of 1992. We're thinking about the job losses that happened there and issues with job security. Um, we don't really think about rural places. We usually tend to think about urban centers. And places like Tohoku were also greatly impacted by this recession and that issue has carried through the disaster even till today. So many of the businesses in Fukushima, Miyagi, and Iwate were susceptible pre-disaster and especially post-disaster to economic takeovers by larger corporations and companies. Especially in Miyagi, we had a big issue with protecting local fishing rights from general privatization. Um, there were grievances lodged against the governor specifically for generating rhetoric that generally delegitimated the historical legacy of fishers on the Sanriku coast that ignored the experiences and expertise of locals and really devalued them as critical participants in decision-making processes. Especially in the case of Minami Sanriku, we have had great losses to industry. So 56% declines in agriculture and forestry, 67% declines in fisheries. And a lot of the work I've done in Minami Sanriku with these individuals, I ask them about their ability to participate in decision-making processes. How much power or influence do they think they have in creating change? And unfortunately, over the past four years, uh, many of them have said they have no ability to participate. They don't feel like they can engage in these recovery processes, um, but they can participate in organizations. So they do feel represented uh, by associating with an NPO or an NGO. Um, moving forward onto disasters. I want to look at how policies really have undermined the communities I've worked in. Uh, I think most people are unaware that previous to 311, the Disaster Countermeasures Basic Act, or the DCBA, um, led with the assumption that victims and local communities are responsible uh, for recovery and restoration. Um, there really was no solid focus on um, disaster recovery or on um, disaster prevention, and nothing at all on disaster reconstruction. Um, it sort of subsumed that local resiliency would sort of fill in these gaps. And of course, we know as people working in civil society organizations, uh, those gaps were not filled until much later. So essentially, there was not significant consideration for long-term broad regional responses. Um, and this left huge gaps in 
uh, response to the disaster that ended up being filled by people like us. When we really look at early responses, disaster measures were not consistent nor systematic, which left most communities in a state of paralysis. I won't get into all of the laws and sort of policies that affected communities, but each year after the disaster, there was always a change to policy that really affected the way in which communities could mobilize. What I do want to highlight is that when we look at the work that's happened in the past 10 years, there is focus on local communities, sustainability, recovery, and resilience. Those are sort of the four key topics that come up. And this is something that the DCBA still has not addressed well, and I think is the source of many of the problems that we've had post-disaster. So the, DC, the DCBA um, does not include systems which ensure the participation and involvement of communities and residents in the development and reconstruction planning process. Um, as such, the key to maintaining and improving the resilience of communities is to stabilize them, retain their local populations, and try to build upon the society that existed prior to the disaster, rather than trying to replace it with a new community or doing top-down interventions. Okay. Um, however, there is no provision in the act that considers these views of local people in the development of reconstruction plans and other activities. Um, aside from public hearings, which really aren't uh, dialogues on local problems and don't equip locals to cultivate their problem-solving skills and to really discuss what they see as solution to specific problems. As a final note on where to go from here, I believe that ongoing social investments must continue and that these efforts be strengthened significantly to help mitigate the many social, economic, political um, ills Tohoku is dealing with. And as a final note, We've seen the power of volunteerism, especially after the Kobe earthquake, and even more so after 311. Uh, Japanese people do want to participate in civic society where we support each other through various organizations or various networks. Um, I feel very strongly about social investment because these investments tend to be based on community needs. So they are context specific and directly address on the ground issues. And we're actually going to be hearing from Angela next and going over a couple examples of this and the importance of social impact um, in these communities. So thank you so much for your time. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much for that. And uh, next we're gonna be hearing from Angela Ortiz. Angela is a representative director for the nonprofit organization OGA for Aid. She is a long-term resident of Japan, been here over 30 years, living in rural Japan and Tokyo. She's a social impact entrepreneur, a CSR professional author, and a fitness enthusiast. Her career began as an early childhood educator in Tokyo in 2005. She transitioned into social impact after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami disasters of Northeastern Japan, where she established her own company, Place to Grow, a community building nonprofit using fitness and language exchange to inspire and connect children in the rural province of Tohoku. In 2016, she moved into the corporate sector, supporting companies like H&M and Adidas Japan, launch and grow social and environmental <coughs> sustainability programs. She supports with project management, impact marketing, cross-section stakeholder engagement, and participant development. She also has a wealth of experience in public speaking, as we will see. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. I'm going to share a, a lot of pictures and stories with you today, hopefully to illuminate some of the amazing research that Kaylee shared in her overview of the situation. I'm going to uh, base most of my stories out of Sandikucho, which was one of the few towns to really hit like over 95% infrastructure damage in the aftermath of the 311. Um, this is where we have been working these last 10 years, although we have made uh, great lengths to try and connect members of these communities to their neighboring communities. Let me share the startup story of this with you all. So in the top left corner, you can see a picture of my mom and my sister and my father in the background in our home in Aomori. Uh, this is really where the initiative began, a very simple grassroots organization of people directly impacted, wanting to reach out and help others. On the picture next to it, you can see, if you read a little Japanese, it says, Kokoro wa hitotsu ganbarimashou. And this is myself and a colleague with the daughter of the Hotel Kanyo in Minami Sandiku. And I'm sharing this because we didn't go in as a large organization connecting with local government in the beginning. We went in connecting with people and their families in a very 
um, human to human, very personal way. And the bottom photos, you can see the aftermath of, of all this activity was the evolution of a distribution system, delivering food and water to families that had fallen through the cracks of the government distribution system. Um, here you can see a picture of extreme <coughs> collaboration between volunteers. Some of these were from Sendai, from um, Utsunomiya, of course, some of us from Aomori working directly alongside the Japan Self-Defense Force. This was something really unheard of before then, and it showed how in these trying times, people just had to get up and work together and figure out what to do. And this is a community outside of Minami Sandiko, actually in Kisanuma, where we work directly with local fathers, mothers, community leaders, the Kuchos and the Hanchos to ensure that uh, members of society who had not completely lost all their housing and therefore they were not eligible for a, the larger amount of government support, they were literally without food and water in some situations. And that's where we were able to fill a gap. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about finding the gap as volunteers, because the government has, you know, preset plans. And then what actually happens on the ground is often quite different. Um, in this case, the disaster was so large that a lot of the stakeholders who were responsible for these communications were not able to fulfill their role. And so we needed to actually find where was the gap, because there's no point in us doing what the government is already doing or mirroring what the Japan Self-Defense Force was doing. And we had to find this by just asking a lot of questions and going around very manual sort of door to door, knocking and talking with people, thousands of hours of just talking with people about what their situation was. And in our case, the initial gap we found was access to clean water. So you can see in these photos, some of us delivering door to door as the society moved from shelters to Kasetsu Jutaku. Here you can see uh, one of the needs we found, one of the gaps you were feeling was the space for people to come together. As you saw in the first photo, 95% infrastructure damage meant there was literally no place for people to go and hang out, find a moment of peace and respite. And this was actually thanks to Mitsubishi's donation. So this is where I started to learn about social responsibility. We were able to take grants, work together with company stakeholders and the local community to define, okay, what do we need right now? And even if it was a temporary need, like we only need this for six months because within six months, the local government would build you know, community centers. Then organizations like us were able to fill those short gaps, even for small times. And this is how the project Santa Soul Train evolved as well. People needed emotional um, reconnection, a place where, you know, if their voices weren't being heard in the government or public um, structures, this was a place where the businessmen and local people could come together and talk about what did they want for their town and what they were going through. In 2011, we started a very tiny initiative called Green Farmers Project, which later evolved into Green Farmers Miyagi. It is now a successful long onion company in the Motoyoshigun region. Here you can see some of the family members and the uh, employees of this uh, company. But this really started out myself, three or four colleagues, uh, five or six local farmers who were had nothing to do because their land had been destroyed. And instead of buying produce in Tokyo and shipping it up, we decided, why don't we try and grow it here? The second, uh, how do you say, gap that this served was finding productive activities for local people to engage in. You know, keeping busy, keeping productive was really, really important at this time, mostly for moral support. But secondly, for people to start to revision, what could my next level revenue look like? What does the next level of the economic uh, situation of Minami Sanliku look like? And more specifically for me as a former farmer. Please look at this slide later. You can find some links to some great videos outlining the Green Farmers Miyagi's like origin story, where you see what the volunteers, again, finding that gap, right? The farmers, they could plant, but they couldn't go in there and cut down trees and start fertilizing. And that's where we were able to get a lot of volunteer support. And then this is where, again, um, responding to the changing needs, we split the organization and the farming in initiative branched out into its own business venture. And we took 
the learnings from those last five years and said, okay, now we're going to focus from 2015 onward on the soft skills of the community. Kids like this, where were they? What was their education looking like? Was their current education and living situation preparing them for an adult life that was something their parents had not known? So you can see a lot of different uh, pictures here of the different activities we did, in person workshops. And then at the very last sort of right bottom screen, you can see a Zoom workshop. And obviously, this was 2020 in response to COVID not allowing us to visit in person anymore. The Santa Soldier, and I want to touch on in detail just really quickly because what first evolved as just an event to support the community members to rebuild has actually gone global. Um, in the bottom hand corner, you can see some uh, reindeer, local people dressed up as reindeer. This is from the Kumamoto disaster a couple of years ago, where children in Minami Sandiku sent stockings and cards to children there. In 2015, children in Minami Sandiku sent cards to the children in Nepal who were displaced by the earthquake there. And we have found all organically that the children relate really strongly and their parents also relate very strongly to other communities who have similar situations or who have overcome similar hardships. And so one of our roles of filling that gap is to connect them in ways that are not just powerful and meaningful, but also fun. And this project connects over 15 schools and companies every year. So in summary, if I could go over very quickly these last 10 years, the the gaps that we were finding we could help with was really helping people deal with a sense of loss um, and loss of self-value in the very early years when everything they knew had been completely changed. And this is where I like to bring up the word recovery versus rebuilding because there's really no going back to what they had. It is about redefining their future. And that's where the economic support ideas that came in from us and from people in our community. <clears throat> Hours sitting around, sometimes like Nomikai style, sometimes just standing in the field discussing what was possible and asking if we could get this type of support for you or if, if you had that support, could you build a new farming co-op? And then just helping them build that story up. As we moved into the 2015, 2018 years, you know, the governments were providing new housing. A lot of people were just having to wait, but you know, it was coming. They knew that that support was coming. What they didn't have was, well, how do we raise our children for this next age of Tohoku that we have no experience in? Connected to the global community, looking at online businesses, and all these different aspects that their parents and grandparents just couldn't be role models for. And this is where volunteers really could fill that gap. Uh, this last slide that I'm showing with the pictures, I wanted to share because this is up, us taking part in the Tokoyasai Festival. And this experience allowed me to see how valuable group visiting can be. So whether that's a corporate volunteer group, or just some volunteers coming together, taking part in the key celebrations of the city as they rebuild was very powerful for them because it sent a message that all these small steps matter and we're celebrating with them. And so in the picture on the right where you see a gentleman in blue leading a bunch of volunteers from Johnson Johnson and Place to Grow, uh, we participated as a contestant in their dance uh, competition and we won an award for showing up which was very applicable because that is the principle of place to grow is to show up and remind survivors that you know we're still here and we still think of them um some of the voices that i've heard over the years is let's go back to something that kaylee was talking about in the early years i can't go to that event because i'm not from that neighborhood originally um, so even though support was coming in, organized by local governance, local communities didn't feel like they had access to that. Um, or that support is only for those who lost this much of their house, this many loved ones, you know, businesses. There was all these sort of criteria around what they could do. And that really, unfortunately, fragmented the community in those early years. Uh, another very interesting aspect I heard just about two years ago was, was there was there are some there are some 
region and have done so for decades, but they rec they represent their hometown. But recently they were talking and this, I just overheard them saying this. They were like, you know, it's changed so much. The new infrastructure, it's not even the town that we remember. Do we even really have a right to claim ownership or connection to it? So through this like rebuilding and this re-evolution of the towns, many, many people are feeling a disconnect. Um, and then, of course, because there were a lot of volunteers and entrepreneurs that moved to the area, there's been some great new growth. But then they also feel like, well, I don't have the clout um, to really lead in business in this community because I'm not a local. And there is, you know, such legacy and heritage there. People are still waiting in limbo, waiting for their houses. There's still people in Kasatsujutaku even to this day. And then on a more positive note, um, some of the mothers more recently we're saying that we do hope volunteers can continue to come and visit. They value the involvement and also they can see very directly how the children becoming more familiar with the global community is going to strengthen their chances as an adult. So to wrap things up from my side, I would like to ask any of you who are interested in the next 10 years of community rebuilding uh, in Tohoku to please join our mailing list because we will be continuing to redefine what exactly you can do. But just in general, it's part of like bringing your energy, your inspiration and ideas. These are really key and still very well, how do you say, like it, people want them and they love um, hearing them. Um, also, we need to define what does an online uh, program look like for many of these communities, working with the Kyoiku Inkais, the Board of Educations in these communities. The Kataribe storytelling has, be has started to become a key method for how local survivors want to not only warn the next generations, but also hope that governments will take into account their direct experiences when they start to create their next level preparedness plans. Um, also, as we grow the Santa Soul train, we are looking for representatives to help us connect to other communities in Iwate and um, Fukushima, as well as other NPOs around Japan. The density of experience that you have this is just so impressive. I, I feel really privileged to have these panelists to, you know, you think you know something about this because you've read about it, you've studied, I've been up there many times, but to hear it from people who are really doing this serious, intensive work on the ground is, is very, very informative. Next up, we have uh, Sarah Jean Rosito. Sarah Jean has worked with nonprofit NGOs in Japan for some 20 years. She's an instructor and independent consultant at TUJ. She's conducted skill-based trainings, coordinated programs on themes as varied as humanitarian response, rights of PWDs, and HIV AIDS in Japan. She has assisted corporations in developing effective community engagement, CSR and philanthropy programs. Sarah Jean has also represented US organizations in Japan and has taught courses on social movements, civil society and conflict mediation at Sophie University and Temple University's Japan campus. She is an advisor for Japanese organizations such as the Asian Rural Institute, A Place to Grow and Mirai no Mori. She holds a Columbia master's uh, international affairs degree with a focus on human rights in East Asia. Sarah Jane, welcome. Thank you so much, Kyle. And I want to thank uh, you for organizing this event today. And I'd like to also thank Angela for sharing um, her direct experience and also Kaylee for sharing her know-how with us all today. I'm going to actually ask us to all step back for just a minute. And I'm going to really focus a little bit on a bigger picture issue on how this all has impacted the nonprofit sector here in Japan. Um, we probably have read a lot, at least my students or former students that are here today have read a lot about how Kobe in 1995 has impacted the nonprofit sector. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about what are the more recent impacts due to this disaster. Like Kobe, um, Prior to the disaster, there were some uh, various political issues, um, such as the early scandals in the 90s, the, eight, the Green Cross HIV scandal in the 90s, change of power LDP. We had other things going on 
before 2011, but those things were not enough to really ignite civil society into what, what maybe we have seen or know. And I'd like to look at a few these five issues before wrapping up with some challenges and opportunities. And I'll be leaving a few items for the very last five minutes about what you can do to get involved. So first I wanna talk about expansion of reach. Um, and I'd like to approach this from two different perspectives. One existing organization such as Peace Boat um, and Tokyo, um, uh, Tokyo English Lifeline, Tokyo Ego no Chino Denwa, um, existing organizations that were able to utilize their assets. In the case of Peace Boat, there are thousands of past volunteers, there are thousands of past, past boat, uh, boat, excuse me, uh, uh, boat voyage um, participants, and actually bring that power to Tohoku, bring those people up there. Um, Ego Nuchi no Denwa, Tokyo, formerly known as in, uh, Tokyo English Lifeline, was able to bring their uh, mental health expertise to both train organizations, to train volunteers at the beginning, but also start to focus on training different people who had different needs because the scope and the scale of this disaster and the trauma was so broad. And to also start thinking about the different languages in need. Also based on needs, these are all based on real needs. We had several organizations uh, be created because there were, these needs were not met. Two in particular, um, Gender Equality and Disaster Risk Reduction, which was formed, founded by the former governor of, um, of Chiba. And then the Women's Network for East, Disaster, East Japan Disaster, Rise Together, was founded by academics to um, first research what was missing about gender inclusion, but not just that PWDs, persons with disabilities, people consider themselves non-binary, gender sexual minorities, what were their needs? Well, how were their needs not being met? And then actually start creating trainings around those for future disasters. Existing organizations such as the Impact Foundation, which was focused on women's entrepreneurship, um, went up to see like, how can they use their know-how? So there was quite a big expansion of reach of existing organizations as well as development of new organizations. Another key aspect for us to look at is intersector collaboration. And something that's important to remember that there were a lot of, um, Kaylee brought this up a little bit, um, I'd like to add to this is that after the Kobe disaster, there were network organizations set up for how does civil society react in future disasters. However, they were either highly localized, like Rescue Stockyard, which is based in Nagoya, or they were more general MPO networks like Miyagi, Sendai Miyagi MPO Center and Nihon MPO Center, or they were focused on overseas disasters. So these overseas disaster organizations had the expertise in the humanitarian response, as well as the networks, as well as the connection to international resources, whereas the localized organizations brought the local know-how, brought the connections to the people, as well as local governments. And together, they formed the Japan Civil Network for Disaster Relief in East Japan, JCN for short. In both Japanese and English, the name is probably a bit too long. So, these partnerships and this organization was founded not just by nonprofit leaders, not just by network organizations, but also by domestic and international corporations and uh, leaders in the academia and um, research field. This network was very important for taking feedback from the different towns, from the different villages, through the different members to actually bring it forth to the government in redevelopment of different areas. Um, this was also important because a lot of small organizations on their own would not be able to say, get um, the audience of the governor, get the audience of the self-defense force. I use this picture in particular because we had, a, in this picture, we have the head of a PBV, Peace Boat Disaster Volunteer Center, sitting with the self-defense force, sitting with the head of the US military in Japan. So this level of intersector collaboration 
was quite new. We had it happen at the local area in the business sector, but at all different sectors at all different levels. What these different organizations brought were different networks, different resources, but it also helped bring some new institutions and the institutionalization of good practices. Based on three to four years of work with um, international organizations, specifically um, US-Japan Council, uh, Tomodachi Initiative, and majorly uh, uh, Mercy Corps, in 2016, the Japan Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, JVOAD, was founded. While modeled on the NVOAD, which is the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster in the US, it is very localized, but it still includes all members of all sectors, um, public sector, business sector, civil society, but also, although not listed here, um, looking at network professional organizations, domestic, international, and linking to the military or self-defense force. So that when future disasters happen, as we have seen when they were founded in 2016, information could be passed more quickly um, and they could react as we see in some of the pictures here uh, in Kumamoto much more effectively. Also, although this organization existed prior to the Tohoku disaster, um, the NGO corporate coalition network, it really was after Tohoku that it expanded and became much more vibrant. That the importance of corporate, um, whether at the local, the business, local business level, the national, or even the international level, these networks founded really helped um, educate the business sector as well in their roles domestically. And also you will see a big focus now is on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and good corporate practices, not just when a disaster strikes, but, um, but more broadly. I'll add something else really important here. We cannot forget that um, there were evaluation of response is also key. There were three key evaluations. One, all three were funded by overseas money, one through Japan Platform, one through um, Nihon MP, Japan MPO Center, uh, funded by World Vision, and the third um, through Jan uh, done by JANIC, which was funded by Give to Asia as a disclosure, that's where I worked. And based on that, we said, what worked well, what didn't work well? And one of the areas we did find, although people from Human Rights Now, which is a Japan-based NGO, um, said we need to pay more attention to vulnerable populations and Domoto-san, women, gender and disaster risk reduction said we need to pay attention to more vulnerable populations. We actually had to institutionalize some of those practices. Um, we developed some trainings based on those learnings. Again, another disclaimer, I organized this training for Japan platform, but not just for Japanese NGOs, for NGOs in South Korea, Taiwan, and mainland China, which was quite, um, which was quite a big deal to actually have them all at the table together so that organizations would be ready locally, but also internationally to collaborate when future disasters hit. And I have heard stories from people responding in Nepal and um, Kumamoto about how helpful this was. So bringing those international standards to Japan and in Japanese trainings was really significant. This is so important that things are localized. It's not just language but put in the context where people can really use them. And this is something now you can find on the Peace Boat Disaster Volunteers Training website, these types of international standards. Speaking of which, the Peace Boat Disaster Volunteer Training Program, again, another disclaimer here, um, was really an important um, step ahead for us thinking about how do we prepare ordinary people for when future disasters strike? So people are, have been trained throughout Japan. People have been before COVID as well as being trained on the peace boat itself. And there's closer to a thousand, sorry, the 700 number is a little bit old, actually certified disaster leaders, uh, disaster volunteer leaders around Japan um, in the corporate sector, in the university, in high schools, 
and just ordinary citizens, which means that if should a disaster happen in a particular place, there are these approximately 1,000 people that know how to bring together a team of volunteers for, um, for response. I'm going to bring up the last two points very short, very simply because of time. Another one is advocacy, uh, influencing policy, influencing government agenda and or budgets. Um, I already talked about how these networks were forged um, because we had to do this. Local organizations and international organizations had to work together. In local government, domestic, international government agencies had to work together. This actually was really important for beginning dialogue that was much more difficult in the past. We, we may know that in Japan, advocacy is not a strong suit of nonprofit organizations, but these networks gave more legitimacy and organizations, whether they're newly founded like Place to Grow or long-term existing organizations like Peace Boat, had this group legitimacy as well at the national level, as well as at the local level based on their own work. And bringing together voices from the community to government officials was, was really seen differently than it was in the past. And these local group meetings, these national meetings were highly important. Um, in 2015, uh, the nonprofit sector led by JANIC and I'll wrap up in just a minute, was able to put together these ideas in form of, of a recommendation which were actually presented at the UN level as well as at the Japanese national government level. So looking more closely where we are today, this has been really helpful for continuing advocacy, which I will tell you in 2001, the first time I wrote an article about the importance of policy advocacy of NGOs, I was told, it's just not gonna happen, so forget about it. It's not our culture. It's not about culture, it's about the power and role and legitimacy of civil society agencies in any given society. I will skip the part about localization because I think you heard a lot from, from Kaylee and from Angela about this, except to say the organizations that learn to work locally with communities really did much better. This is an example from Aichi Neto, which is an organization in Aichi Prefecture. And Amano-san, who's the founder and head of this organization, knew that you have to work with people to have a long-term impact. And we worked together on just getting the Tanabata Festival up and running to then find out what were the other needs, about listening to people, find out what they want, find out what the real needs are, so that we could have a two or three year plan and work with people. Um, other groups such as Fukushima Action Project were supported by Peace Boat for a long time. Um, but I do wanna say, just say a few things about the challenges and I will wrap up very quickly. Um, some of the challenges larger organizations had were because of not being local, in my, in my viewpoint, excuse me, not being localized enough. I worked with several projects that looked really good. However, the leaders withdrew after the first year when the big giving, when the big donations from overseas withdrew and just left the project to be done whatever with. Part of it was sometimes due to a lack of listening to people. Part of it was lack of resources. Another part was really lack of localized engagement. I mean, sometimes it was the person had to actually go get a different job to make money. I think there were a lot of, we experienced a lot of challenges, but we also learned a lot. Um, I just finished the talk about how COVID has impacted um, the civil society. And I just want to say some organizations have been able to carry over some of these learnings, such as the use of uh, social media, such as the use of how do we use new technology into the COVID era so that how do we engage with people differently? And a lot of organizations are still learning. How do we use Zoom better? How do we use WebEx better? How do we use these different tools? But a number of local, local organizations have really been abandoned by the public um, based on stigma, based particularly around poverty-related issues, 
or because they're not seen generally socially as important. Um, so, and we've had a big reduction overall in volunteering over the past two years, even before COVID. So I would like to um, keep that in the back of everyone's mind because I would like to um, raise a few points at the final wrap up about what you can do to get better involved. And thank you very much. I apologize for speaking a wee bit over. Thank you. This being the 10 year anniversary of the disasters, there's been a tremendous amount of media attention and there was a long gap after the initial disaster started in which there was not much focus on that region. And a lot of it dealt with the nuclear crisis as opposed to the recovery of the communities per se. How has your experience differed from the way in which the media has represented the disaster recovery trajectory? I feel like um, the media really focuses on these big, you know, economic and like national political subjects. And I saw this from day one too, where unless it's like a specific time of year or every five years, they're not actually that interested in talking about what's really going on from a human perspective as a resident long term. They really loved the dramatic stories of, to be very frank, death and destruction in the first year. But then it was like once a year on the Japan Times, they'd tell the story of the, you know, the phone booth in Otsuchi where people could go talk to their loved ones. There was very little focus on what is it like to be a human living in these times long term. So again, I add on to that. I, sure. I, um, I was feeling in the last two weeks as I was watching Japanese news every night that even though there was focus on a particular person's story, it's not the now, it's about the then. And I understand that there's a part of uh, commemoration and respect for the people who have passed and the trauma people who have that have, you know, what they've experienced. That's very important. But I think the resilience, the different coping mechanisms, people and communities, because, you know, there's a lot of different types of people in the community, in different communities. I think that's left out as well as the, the diverse voices of people in the communities, because I do know that in some communities where People were quite angry that they had these meetings with government officials and they felt it was very tatemai that it was like, okay, thank you, got us all together. Three years later, four years later, none of our ideas have been included. So what the hell does this mean? And Kaylee wants to jump on. <laughs> I was just going to say, I agree with the whole tatemai discussion. Um, the people I've worked with since 2014, even though a lot of the media portrays this sort of championing of recovery and this resilience and everything like that. They really don't show how people are, are really engaging with things. They don't really show the reality of things that Angela was talking about. And that can really cause distress for people because what it kind of shows or showed the rest of Japan was that Tohoku is okay. Tohoku is sort of recovered. And what that does is it stops people from engaging. It stops resources from coming in because of how these communities are presented to the public. Um, I can remember conversations with residents who say, you know, uh, you're organizing this meeting with us to talk about local problems. Why is it you organizing this meeting and not someone from the town office or, or someone from this other agency who visited us three years ago? And as Sarah Jean was saying, haven't returned to us, haven't followed up on our concerns. So there's really an issue with putting people's sort of goals and solutions that they're thinking of into action, um, especially through traditional means or traditional systems. And really that's where sort of civil society really steps in and tries to fulfill those needs. Um, places like Place to Grow, a lot of the organizations, organizations that Sarah Jean was mentioning that really provide training and make people capable leaders in these communities to help organize people. I really think that's something that the media misses out on and it's really detrimental um, to really cultivating the future of communities in Tohoku. Tomoko Ishida asked, what was your first contact with Tohoku? Did you live in the area prior to the earthquake? 
How did you become interested in this subject area? And what kind of reaction have you received from the local people? Um, so we, my family lived in northern Tohoku, in Aomori, for over 15 years before the disaster. And my brother was in Sendai and he evacuated. So in my case, it was actually my family was directly impacted. And then we had colleagues or, or acquaintances in the town and naturally sort of just went to help after seeing how traumatic uh, the situation was. Um, the second question was, what did she say? How, how have we been well received? It was very interesting that people were, of course, so welcoming in the beginning because they were in such distress. And anyone who was lending a hand was, they were ready to take your hand and work with you. But as time went on, like five, six years, the reaction we got was, you know, we respect you and we welcome you to a certain degree, as much as you will as an outsider in Japan, because you keep showing up. Like there's a commitment that we see from you and the people around you that we have to respect. And there, there was just so much trust built through that continuing to show up. So I think that goes back to when Sarah Jean was talking about long-term perspectives for projects are so important. And that's one of the reasons on a very human level, why you can get, um, why you can generate that kind of trust and that kind of cooperation. Um, as Kyle mentioned at the very beginning in 2014, I actually came to Japan when I was about 20 years old. And uh, Kyle actually introduced me to Angela. I called Angela over the phone and I didn't know if she spoke Japanese or not. So we kind of went back and forth through this awful Japanese English conversation. <laughs> um, and I got sort of hooked into at the time, which was OGA for aid. And then that transformed into place to grow. And so my first visit to Minami Sanriku was in 2014. And I get asked a lot, like, why do I continue to work in Minami Sanriku? Why do I continue uh, to return there? They think, most locals think I'm very strange, but they're very happy to see me when I'm there. Um, and that's because I have very personal experiences with disaster. Um, my hometown is located in a rural area. And in 2014 and 2007, or not 2014, 2004, in 2007, some of the most destructive fires in California history um, started in my hometown. So we were essentially burned to the ground. So I can understand sort of the level of destruction that people were dealing with. And when I visited these communities, I was immediately reminded of, of those experiences. And when I was much younger, I was like nine or 12 and I couldn't really do anything. Um, but now that I'm much older, I can actually you know, help um, with interventions and help communities. Um, as for how I've been received, when I when I first went there to do volunteer work, people were happy that you know I was coming to help them. I'm, I'm free labor, uh, but I just I will never forget this. I distinctly remember speaking with um, an older farmer, and he said, um, "You won't return, like you 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 like you make these promises, but you don't return." And I realized that. Um, these communities have gone through a lot of emotional labor of taking in these volunteers, creating connections with them. Volunteers leave. Um, they're not being, you know, they're not being not ill natured or anything. They just have to leave. Um, but I got this sense of sort of sadness from him of like, yes, you'll say you return, but that, that won't really happen. And so then I'm a very stubborn person. Um, so I made it sort of my goal. Uh, to return to Minami Sanriku by whatever means necessary every year after. So every summer for the past six years, I have been in Japan for three to four months. And actually in 2019 and 2020, I just lived in Minami Sanriku. Um, and so as Angela said, showing up matters, continuing to show up matters. I you know, would come back and that farmer, I'll never forget, he was like, oh my God, you came back. He was, he was just so shocked. Um, and we've actually become really good friends as a result of that. Um, so that's my sort of answer to that question. My experience is really different because I never lived up in Tohoku and really I was working as a consultant, but I will say this um, as somebody who started working for an overseas, um, for an overseas donor agency the, within a week, of the Tohoku disaster. Based on the fact that I think it was March 13th after the disaster, I set up an English blog explaining who was doing what where based on whatever info had come to me through my pre-existing Japanese NGO network. Um, people were really excited to see me back, 
But I do have a little funny story from my first trip to Tohoku, if I may share it. I was up there with people from Kobe, um, up with all Japanese people from Kobe um, who had no experience working in Japan. They had experience working in international disasters, much younger than me. Um, we were mostly with elderly and pida, uh, persons with disabilities, shogai ga arukata, almost all day. And at the end of the day, I was having dinner with these people from this organization, remaining nameless, very bright, multilingual, overseas educated, worked in like Somalia, whatever. And they said to me, you know, they were saying gai kokuji, gaijin, gaijin, gaijin all day. You were the only gaijin all day. I said, no, 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 I was gai kokujin, hitori. You were gaijin. They were young, genki, you know, tattooed, whatever. And that was fine. They brought this energy. But I think there were some of the young Japanese people I worked with who were overseas educated. They didn't see themselves as outsiders, but they were. And it was an interesting experience for me to translate that experience for a lot of professionalized people, because this takes time. Building the networks takes time. And sometimes they saw me come back six months later, but they didn't see you know, Emma-chan or whatever her name is come back. And that was kind of interesting for me. And I'll stop there um, because I'm not really the implementer. I'm the, I'm from the support side, which is actually how I met Angela um, and many other people. Mm -hmm. A colleague of mine the other day mentioned some of the media coverage. And there's been a lot of media coverage in the last week to 10 days referring to it as drive-by journalism. And it wasn't that it was necessarily wrong, but it wasn't so deeply informed and it certainly wasn't based upon relationships. And what I admire about the work that you've done is you've really over the years built relationships, which is a whole different level of understanding. I mean, within academia, that's ethnographic qualitative work, but it's just understanding the lived experience and nothing can replace that. We have a question by a TUJ student, um, Denier. Uh, Denier, could you please raise your question? I remember there was a mention uh, earlier about uh, the social relevancy uh, of these NPO groups. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how can we talk with people every day uh, to get others to be more aware uh, that these groups still exist? Um, and that there's still work to be done. I think the first thing is we need to be like educated consumers. I just put some links in the chat. You know, if you're really interested in local stuff, if you're in Tokyo, look at the Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Voluntary Action Center website. There's a whole list of organizations, Japan MPO Center website. If you're interested in disasters, I just put some links in there. If you're interested in what's going on internationally, um, Take a course at TUJ on Japanese civil society. That's another option. <laughs> sorry, that, sorry, maybe Anthony will uh, say don't do it. Um, but anyway, um, but I think the first thing is we need to know like, what is should we interested? Is it disasters? Is it community engagement? Is it like poverty? Is it children's issues? Whatever that is, there's an organization doing something. Based on that, just like there's still information sessions often online or volunteer onboarding. Um, and now I want to say something really positive about COVID. Some organizations have volunteers all over the world being involved because we have Zoom, we have WebEx, we have whatever, we have this technology and organizations are getting better at managing online volunteers. Know what it is you're interested in reach out to those groups and just jump right in and I'll send it to Angela. I would only echo that by saying, you know, in this day and age, ignorance is a choice. There are Facebook groups, events going on every day on like every subject under the sun. There are websites, every NGO is out there actively promoting their work and recruiting volunteers. So it really just starts with you understanding what am I interested in and am I interested in civil society and how does this benefit me in the future? And if you can understand where your interest lies, a 
very simple Google search will give you so many links and so many leads. And then I would I would ask you or challenge you to not be passive about it because civil society really requires a proactive stance. So instead of just liking an organization's page, comment, ask questions. That's the big thing is ask questions, ask more questions so that the, the conversation will grow. And that would be my my suggestion. Thank you. Over to you, Kaylee. I would say there's also a bit of sort of personal responsibility that you need to decide to take on, um, especially because you are going to be sort of supporting vulnerable communities. And so that sort of responsibility can manifest in a variety of ways. It can be as simple as, for example, subscribing to organizations sort of emails. So you get information about what's going on. And if you have the opportunity, like say you had free time one week and they have an event going on, and they need volunteers, you would be able to engage. And you're able to engage because you have surrounded yourself with the necessary information in which to find these things like Angela was talking about. Um, the other thing I'd like to plug is the foreign volunteers like Japan Facebook page is extremely active. Like when COVID was happening, that thing was full of resources. Um, similarly, when we had the earthquake actually just this past month, that was very scary for me. I thought we might have another tsunami and I was in a panic calling everybody in Japan. Um, there was a lot of resources that flooded that page. So it's a good page to also just have on your radar um, because it just organizes people from all over Japan and they have multiple languages represented on there. Um, they also talk about tell a lot on there that Sarah Jean mentioned today. Um, and so it's a really great place to access resources just generally speaking. Um, we have a question from Anthony Carter who I think may have taken your class Sarah Jean because I recommended to him to take it. Um, we do have, I think, a number of people here who've taken your class. Um, Anthony, do you would you like to put the question to the panelists directly? Yeah, um, yeah, you did recommend that. That's why I got a lot of homework this weekend. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. I was asking about the volunteer disaster programs. Should this should be a standard in a community? There was nothing in place before this happened, like. Didn't they have a coordinator or something that was in the city? I'll start with the big plan and then maybe if Angela and Kaylee want to add to that. Um, so what Peace Boat does is a bit different because they're, they're coordinating independent volunteers. After the Kobe earthquake in 96, there was a system set up whereby the Social Welfare Council and I'm sorry, I skipped this in class last week. The Social Welfare Council in each town actually opens up a disaster volunteer center. And those are people who work in the city hall. Um, let's talk about a pre-post 211. Pre-211, those people did not necessarily have any disaster management training. They were also trained in a way, this was set up thinking more of about a Kobe, more isolated, regionally isolated type of disaster. They weren't really trained to say handle thousands of people coming from not just across the country, but across the world. So the, yeah, great. Um, there were different systems put in place, but there was also really, they were really unequal really different by prefecture. I have for the past year been living in Shizuoka and where we are, um, for example, um, pre-311 pre disaster training was part of junior high and high school. Post-311, it's also part of elementary school. I think beforehand elementary school was optional. Um, Anybody, if you go anywhere around, you see signs now around where I live, at least four languages for tsunami evacuation centers. There's signs everywhere telling you, like these were all part of the 311 changes. I mean, big signs, not the little signs that used to exist. Um, so there were things that happened. The difference with the uh, peace boat training was it was around, maybe it was March 25th meeting of interagency meeting, domestic, international go NGOs, government officials, international embassy staff, where um, I think it was the first time we heard of a, a volunteer mutiny by one NGO that goes nameless. 
they were basically asked to drive to Tohoku and didn't realize they'd be driving basically for 20 hours, no food, no water, nothing, no toilets. Um, they said, and we said, you know what? We, and it was the people from Peace Boat who said, oh, well, we train our volunteers. You guys don't train your volunteers? Nobody was training volunteers because it was the goodness of their own hearts you're supposed to go do and do whatever you can, um, which is why um, the foundation I worked for funded this for about a year. But now what Peace Boat is, this is a business model now, they do it inside corporations. In Japanese corporations, multinational corporations, inside international schools. So these trainings are not necessarily region-based, but maybe you might think of them function-based or clubs, like the Japan, uh, Tokyo American Club. Or, and I know, Anthony, they've done some on some of the US military bases as well, but those are separate from city-based trainings. Um, the city-based trainings, there's a gap by region. Angela, what would you like to add to that? Or Kaylee? I can add on to that, maybe just to give some color. So they have preparedness plans the, from the national government to the local government, and they have plans with bus companies and train companies and food companies about what they're going to do. But one of the challenges is with disasters is that it, you don't get a lot of real life experience. So even on a national level, the, the gentleman running the Japan disaster emergency management could have been in the finance department a year before or was in the childcare department, like, cause they're rotated out. And so unlike other countries, um, we have not really developed very specialized leaders in disaster management and mitigation. And then the second thing that happened with the Tohoku situation was just the scale. If you think about Tokyo, every coup has a different police force and a different management for their fire stations and the way they communicate. And so asking all of Tokyo even to work together in a unified approach is a challenge in itself. Now imagine 600 kilometers of different towns with different plans and different communication languages. It was just far too great a disaster for an efficient response plan or even for anything to go as planned. And then adding on to that, so many of your community leaders passed away in 311. And the replacements that came in were not from that town. So they didn't know what the preparedness plans were. Kaylee, if you have anything Kaylee, to Kaylee, did you want to, I think you bring up a really important thing here about the lack of resources, even though for plans that did exist. Yes, so um, one of the things I think I encounter a lot actually in sort of like Western academia, if I can dive into that a little bit, is this really big assumption and sort of heralding Japan as this monolithic place that can handle disasters all the time and no matter how hard or difficult they are. And it really sets Japan up for failure in a way. Um, and we see that it represented through some of the policies I talked about in my um, presentation, but um, organizations really had to do a lot of backend work um, to really organize and create a foundation to network with each other, because actually there were no basic laws specifying how disaster measures were supposed to be carried out. So immediately after disaster, you had all of these disaster related organizations like uh, OGA for aid who just self-deployed and had no um, sort of support from other networks until they got where they needed to be and then organized with Japan Defense Forces and, and other organizations. So it was sort of like ad hoc. It was like after the fact that all these things sort of um, grew. However, after the Kobe earthquake, there was, as Sarah Jean was mentioning, this really growth in, um, I guess we call it um, the birth of volunteerism in Japan or volunteerism or volunteer, I think it's gunnen, um, sort of the birth of that. And 311 sort of emboldened that process of volunteerism. When we're looking at resources though, um, Japan is very, you know, bureaucratic society. And so if there aren't measures in place, um, they're not going to just magically follow something that they think about doing. So when we look at the DCBA, the Disaster Countermeasures Basic Act, um, Really, there was no provisions for how these communities were supposed to organize. There were no provisions on how reconstruction was supposed to happen. Um, a lot of these ideas came about 
through the sort of reports that Shara Jean showed um, in her presentation. There were amendments that happened after the fact. Um, there were many amendments that happened in 2012, 2013, and 2014 um, to sort of kind of remediate these issues. Um, so I really can't stress enough sort of um, how patchwork uh, this response was um, as a result of these sort of policy limitations. Can I just say that I want to end on a little bit of a positive note about this. Um, uh, in 2004, I worked for another or for an organization called Nietzsche Bay Community Exchange, 2000, 2004, and we had brought disaster mitigation community based experts to Japan to work with the existing disaster groups um, before prior to the Joetsu earthquake. Um, to really do trainings on systems of command and how do you get these different agencies to work together. And nine times out of 10, the response was muri muri nihon deki nai. No, there's no way we can do this in Japan because there's no way we're gonna work with those little volunteer groups. The evolution of that idea has changed a lot. So I want to say positively that this collaboration will have longer term positive impacts and is as we as we approach the pandemic but the lack of resources is still a major issue hand it over to you kyle yeah i wanted to ask you all a question to kind of map the disaster this was such a unexpected and plausible disaster where you had the earthquake the tsunami and the nuclear crisis i heard one american government official say that it would be comparable to having the San Francisco earthquake, the Katrina hurricane, and the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster all happening on the same day. And it covered a broad region of northeastern Japan. So I wondered how you would map the distinctions between the communities that were damaged or destroyed by the tsunami that ran all the way along the coast to those communities close into the Daiichi nuclear plant that were evacuated. In some cases, both of them happened so that some communities were both affected by or damaged by the tsunami and then also had to evacuate. But how do you see the challenges and the distinctions between those, di those different communities? Have they had a different process of recovery, a different psychological mindset, a different way of addressing the state to try to, to get access to resources that would allow them to recover? From what I saw on the ground, um, in the beginning, all the focus was on the Fukushima situation. So the everyday ojichan, obachan, uh, the high school kid, the, the families of Minami Sandiku, Kesenuma, and up north into Iwate were not really getting a lot of focus. And this created an interesting divide, and, and it really kind of drove home that, oh, we're all different, and it, there's going to be different ways of support. But then as time went on, what happened was the stigma of Fukushima was very strong, and the refugees who evacuated, who relocated, had to suffer not only from this, this great fear of, did I catch radiation in a way, right? Was I too close? Will I not be able to have children? High school students being afraid to get married because they were afraid that their children could be disabled. And then on top of all of that sort of huan and that sort of fear, the unknowing, the unknowing of what happened, they then were kind of labeled as, um, well, dirty, right? Or somehow they were stigmatized. So they would move to Ibaraki, they would move to other communities in Japan. And that was something they had to deal with that their counterparts in Miyagi, for example, didn't necessarily have to build, have to deal with. Uh, lastly, let me just talk about the poster children of these disasters. So um, I think all three prefectures have sort of children and a generation that have sort of been whether they want to or not, they are the new faces of those generation and whether their desires are to be an entrepreneur or to be a resilient, strong leader, they have been pushed in sort of to this role and to this image. And I think that's another part of this recovery that we don't talk about from a sort of kokoro no care perspective is are the children really being given a chance to decide what they want for their future and if they want to live into that that role modeling that has already sort of just been sort of placed on them by way of like the JRPR posters that are plastered all over Tokyo Station and all the way up, you know, 
creating these images that now these kids and these families feel like they have to live up to. Interesting. Sarah Jean? You know, I think the stigma, the different stigma that people from Fukushima face, I think is something that until we acknowledge it still exists today, we are, this is just going to be another elephant in the room. And also the stigma around mental health. The range of psychosocial care needed is from really light art therapy that and dance therapy all the way to really serious issues. And I think um, these are the, these stigma issues. This is not unique to Japan, but Japan is where we are. So we need to deal with it where we are. I think that these are things that we all need to take responsibility for and how we talk to people. And that's just something I wanted to say. I'm sorry, no, it wasn't a direct answer to the question, but mm -hmm. it, it constantly comes up in conversations about Fukushima. And mm -hmm. as being the, as Kaylee wrote in the chat, the, the hibaksha of today, the nuclear fallout survivors mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. today. Um, and I think different attention has been, my experience is there's really different attention by different types of media to Fukushima or the tsunami or to the earthquake as if they're three independent things. And we should be careful about that as well. That's all I'll say. Right. Kayla, would you like to address that question? Yes. Um, I actually had the opportunity to interview people in Tokyo actually in 2014 uh, about Fukushima and about this um, stigma that Fukushima people were facing. And out of all the people I interviewed, every single one of them had verbalized in some way a fear of um, Fukushima people and a fear of Fukushima itself. Sort of became this um, monster in sort of people's minds uh, I had some people who would say they wouldn't even drive through Fukushima to get to the rest of Tohoku. I had people say that um, even in, in grocery stores, uh, if they saw something that was from Fukushima, regardless of where in Fukushima it was grown, um, they absolutely would not purchase it. They were sort of um, against that. And so those sort of fears that I encountered at that time, um, unfortunately still exist in many ways. Um, some people feel like they have to hide the fact that they're from Fukushima. They feel like it's shameful uh, in a way, um, in sort of that very Japanese sense. Um, you also have issues where uh, people feel like they really can't integrate anywhere. They've become almost not Japanese. It's, it's a really weird space to live in. They live in this third space where it's really hard for them to connect with others. And I think in some regards, like when we look at Miyagi and Iwate, uh, some people would say like, well, a lot of our problems get overshadowed by the nuclear disaster and vice versa, as Angela was saying, um, because the nuclear disaster is not over. The, the plant is still melting down um, every day since then uh, until, you know, it hits, hits salt water or the core of the earth, you know, whatever it's going to be. Um, so there is at some point a level of division um, between people uh, and sort of bridging those divisions of people who feel like I can't interact with different um, disaster survivors from different areas because we have different experiences or we've re received different resources or, you know, what have you. So really creating those bridges is very important, I think, um, for the future and for really ensuring the well-being of the people of Fukushima. Mm. I've done my own research on Fukushima nuclear disaster in particular, and I was up there in 2016 and 2018, and I saw a huge difference in the decontamination efforts, which I interpreted as being the result of the Olympics being a driver for the government trying to clean things up and put a kind of happy face as they were trying to do this nation branding about the Olympics. They were calling it the Reconstruction Olympics. Did you have that sense of the people up there being attuned to the Olympics as a kind of grand narrative that they had to adjust to, or, or is this something distinct to just people that were directly affected by the nuclear fallout adjacent to the nuclear power plant? Kayla, you were responding. Yeah, to that. I, was, I, I had a very strong response to that. Um, yeah. 
I'm well connected with different people in Fukushima and in Miyagi. And there was a lot of talk of why, why invest all this money into these mega structures for the Olympics when we still have people in temporary right. housing, when we right. can't get the resources that we need. And it was almost like an insult because the places where they were building this, it would, it would be like a grand gesture in a way or I don't know how else to really explain the feelings of people, but they really felt like calling it like the reconstruction Olympics or anything in that way was, it, it was kind of silly. I don't, <laughs> um, and it also sort of made people feel like we can spend all this money on, on this and try to cover up everything that's going on in these regions by painting a, a pretty picture essentially, and kind of ignoring the background that's going on. Um, so people were very aware of sort of like the PR around this um, as well. Um, and that's where I'll leave, leave my comments. Yeah, just to quickly follow on that, what I found a little bit absurd is that they were starting the torch relay on March 25th at Jay Village. This is a former soccer complex that had been overrun with weeds and uh, as it had been abandoned. But it sits right between the Daiichi and the Daini plant which is inside the evacuation zone. The evacuation zone went out to 30 kilometers. That site is, is well within inside that. So it, it just seems so incredibly tone deaf that as a way of trying to announce the world, you know, we've somehow overcome this. They're starting it as close as they can to the Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, I, I don't know about their public relation expertise in that regard. Sarah Jean. Can I say something? You just you just made me think, you know, the, a yeah. big issue behind the anti-Olympics movement, they're always mm -hmm. talking about um, mm -hmm. the, the 70,000 people still in Kasetsuju talk of temporary housing. They're always talking about Fukushima, but mm -hmm. the media has a responsibility for not reporting that there are things going on every week about this. Yeah, yeah. Even in university campuses, not at, not at Temple. And people are not publicly invited to join these discussions. Could you so? Could you speak to that just a little bit more, a little bit more? So, um, yeah, and I'll tell you, I only know a bit about this because I have had students every semester, except for this one, choose this as a topic, about um, as a research topic about the anti-Olympic movement. There's the cost going for the structures. There's all the pre whatever disaster issues there might be, but a big part of it, homeless, um, the increasing um, uh, child poverty rate, et cetera. But now when we look in light of COVID and Fukushima, these uh, people that are still kind of in this third place, um, the movement in terms of the breadth of the issues, anti-Olympic movement in, for Tokyo has gotten wider but they haven't gotten a broader PR face in terms of getting the attraction. Now, I know there's several professors like at Wasada, at, at Jochi, at Keio, who actually bring these speakers in, but they're not allowed to actually invite all the students on campus to listen to these discussions. So I won't say too much before I get myself fired from a job. <laughs> well, it's not like we're recording this and putting it out in the world. <laughs> Angela, do you have any thoughts on that? I'll only add that it's it's very diverse because depending on which level in society you're at, they have completely different feelings. Kaylee, re everything she said, like the average resident. But if you're the mayor or the head of the you know the the mm -hmm. football association, you're kind of voting for the Olympics. Right. Uh, Nikuzen Takada has completely built its reconstruction plan on sports. Kamaishi is where the rugby is going to be had. You know, so there are people that want it. There are people that don't want it. There are people in between, um, and then there are people who just feel like, well, it's all lip service because we have to do this anyway, and we don't we don't care. So just get on with it, whatever. And the J Village thing, like I was there in 2018 because it was actually housing the staff that was managing the nuclear fallout. And it was in the inclusion zone. But of course, that's a massive piece of property that now wants to start getting an income again. So, you know, they were talking about, oh, Adidas, will, it, will you have a little pop-up shop here? And, you know, it's, it's where the, the athletes used to go and train. How do we revitalize this and get it started? Right. You know, it's similar to COVID now where it's like, oh, it's a little dangerous, but as soon as possible, we need to start making money. So there's just so many different opinions is what I'll add. Hmm. 
Well, this may be the last question. We're about out of time here. Actually, we are technically out of time. We'll run over for a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. How do you see the long-term recovery trajectory? I mean, in, as Kayla just mentioned, with the nuclear crisis, that is continuing to unfold. And they say that they'll be dealing with that for a generation. Um, whereas in other parts of the region, it's cleaned up a lot. So you see areas where they have bulldozed back, replanted trees as far as a kilometer inward from the ocean. They're rebuilding the seawalls. Is there a differential rate of recovery between the communities that were not affected by the nuclear crisis and those that were? In other words, as you went, go further north into like some of the places that you were dealing with, Angela, are those recovering and well on their way to recovery compared to the nuclear zone? Um, we interviewed the mayor of Namie a few years ago. And um, in that village of 21,000 people, only 810 people were returning. But I would presume that it's different in areas that aren't directly affected by the nuclear fallout. So do you have a sense of real recovery like in the next five or 10 years in these other parts or, or not? Not, not so much. Um, and this is where like, it's not recovery because it's never going back to what it was even the towns that were not directly impacted have been impacted economically or socially because they're neighboring villages basically there's so many differences in the recovery and the saw the gap between who recovers over the next 30 years and which towns actually just slowly die out I, it's, I don't even know how to, to share that trajectory from town to town, but there are some that are losing population steadily, some that because of the disaster, they have built very strong partnerships with companies and governments, and they're actually going to be thriving. Um, and some, like when we cycle, I threw, cycled through Ofunato and they had built, it's a smaller town, but it's very lively, it's very colorful, compared to the town of a little bit north, Yamadamachi, very gray, a very, very steep and depressing seawall. Uh, the whole atmosphere was completely different. And so you have these different sort of atmospheres that are just starting to, those are becoming the new cultural and the new sort of style of the town. And that is what's then going to decide the future of that because families will be choosing which communities to be a part of based on the opportunities and the atmosphere that they have there. Yeah, I think you make a very important point, which is that there's a lot more diversity among these villages than what appears at a distance. You know, looking from Tokyo, or if you've never been up there, it seems like they're this kind of amorphous, reified thing. Whereas in fact, there are regional dialects, they're, they're almost like entirely different worlds, even communities that are almost directly conjoined to one another, which is, yes. speaks to the fact that it's a lot more complex than what we get out of the media. Um, one last question, uh, Sergi, maybe you could start with this. Um, do you have any final comments or any takeaway or action items for people as we're finishing up here? I have a few um, items and I'll try to keep it really quick. And um, I'm just gonna share, I always have some things because I don't want people to walk away in a negative mood. I would like to encourage everybody to learn, to learn and to share. You know, self-assess, what do you want to do? What are you interested in? Learn more about the issues. If you're in Tokyo, you cannot see this, but you have this Tokyo Bosai Let's Get Prepared booklet. Learn about that, learn about the organizations, share that information with others. You know, improve your skills. I will put in the chat a link to one a training program that we do through a Place to Grow, which is about how to be a better volunteer, how to, um, work with volunteers, how to work with MPOs. Another one is act. And I bring this up more than just like, just get involved. It's a commitment. One problem still often people have with volunteering is thinking it's uh, when you have free time, I'll do something. People are relying on you. So if you're saying I'm going to be helping, whether it's in an orphanage, whether it's in Tohoku, or whether it's you know in a uh, food distribution, it's really important. And this is a way everybody can be a social change agent because you know really making the world a better place feels pretty good. And I will stop the share even though I have other things to do. But those are my simple steps. My simple okay. steps, and I'll pass it over. Okay, Kayla. I think. 
I think Sarah Jean covered a lot about what I was going to say, which is it is a commitment. You do need to make time. Um, and even though it feels like we have so much time right now in the world because of the um, pandemic, I would say if you want to be really become a change maker and you want to sort of um, immerse yourself in these sorts of things, um, maybe partner with a specific organization because that will make it less daunting and you'll sort of be sort of carried through the process. Um, you're always welcome to join us at Place to Grow where we offer specific volunteer training sessions and onboarding and these sorts of things. Um, sort of participating in that way, I think would be very successful. Um, but that's sort of all I have to add to Sarah Jean's comments. And then Angela. So because it's that commitment, you wanna make sure that it's sustainable for you. So I always advocate strategic volunteering or making it part of your lifestyle. So you can read about the eight principles I have for how to be an effective leader on my book. It's on Amazon. But let me just share that the social and environmental sustainability scene is just now really kicking off across every sector. And I'm talking about business. So one of the key things that I believe is important and why volunteering and learning about civil society is so invaluable to your professional future is because when it comes to the business world, we have to be leaders in collective impact. This is where no one's really studied this or become huge leaders in this um, out of university. And every company I've worked for, they're like, how do we work with the local government and this nonprofit? How do we have these conversations? So if you can be someone who knows how civil society works, what are the players, who are the players, and where are they going, you will you can use this in your professional career 100%. And that's why I think it is an important topic to be aware of. And it isn't about philanthropy and it isn't about just giving back because it feels good. It's because these topics are becoming more and more part of everyday business conversation and it will only grow as we move into the future. Wonderful, thank you so much. If you go to the website of each one of the, the people that we've talked about today, you can find they, they have a pretty strong website uh, footprint and you'll be able to get information about what they've done. And I know they've, they've done quite a number of webinars and will be doing some in the future. So I just wanted to thank the panelists today for a really great session. It was very informative as I knew that it would be. Uh, everyone, I appreciate uh, you joining. I apologize for our little technical glitches here and um, live and learn. I hope those won't happen in the future. Uh, in any case, we'll go for now, but everyone, thank you so much. And thank you, particular Sarah Jean, Angela, and Kele. This is Temple University of Japan's ICAST through the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. If you'd like more information and to see our previous archive of events, look to the ICAS website. And also, we have an archive on YouTube with previous events. Thanks for joining us today.